Good morning, Harvest Time. Happy Resurrection Sunday. He is risen. All right, please stand as we begin with an Easter hymn called Christ the Lord is Risen Today.
know we have a loving Heavenly Father that is greater than our obstacles, challenges, and difficulties that I know we all face from day to day. But the Bible has a promise. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He sent his Son Jesus, the one and only, faithful, true, and holy. He's the Son of Righteousness and worthy to be praised. He's Jesus, Savior, Healer, Deliverer, Redeemer, Counselor, Refiner. He's Jesus, Messiah, the Helper, Restorer, the Builder, Rewarder. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He's the bread of life. He's the good shepherd. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. He is the risen and soon coming King, and he is the giver of life and worthy to be praised. Come on, let's give the Lord Jesus a great big praise in this place this morning. Hallelujah. All right, now when I say Christ is risen, your response is Christ has risen indeed. All right, let's try that. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Oh, that's good. Christ has risen. Christ has risen indeed. One more time. Christ has risen. Christ has risen indeed. 
Yeah, come on, one more good praise in this place. God bless you, everyone. Welcome to Harvest Time Church. Would you take a moment, greet the folks around you, and you may be seated this morning. Shake somebody's hand, welcome them today. We're so glad that you've joined us on Easter Sunday morning. I want to welcome everyone that's worshiping with us online at this 1045 a.m. worship service today. We're glad that you're connected to us online and by God's spirit today. We're going to receive an offering this morning. We want to thank you for honoring the Lord with your giving. You can use the offering envelope to give. You can make a gift to any time to Harvest Time Church online at our website htchurch.com or you can give by text there's information for that in your bulletin today just before the ushers come to wait on us for the offering a uh, couple things if you're new to harvest time church we're glad you're here in your bulletin there is a connection card and we'd like to invite you to just tear off that connection card tell us a little bit about yourself we want to know that you were here today and you can drop that in the offering plate as it goes by you in just a few moments um, we do have a welcome center right outside the main sanctuary doors and just to your left um, we have a gift for you if you're new to harvest time and you can stop by the welcome center if you don't have time to fill out your connection card now you can just drop it off at the welcome center on your way out of the sanctuary if you are new to harvest time church we want to invite you for a cup of coffee this coming Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock, we have a reception room in the foyer. It's right in that direction as you leave the sanctuary. And uh, we'd love to meet you. Our pastors are going to be on hand. We'd love to learn your name, shake your hand, and just tell you about some of the opportunities that we have for you and for your family here at Harvest Time Church. That's this coming Wednesday at 7 p.m. We do have 40 life groups that meet during the week. Uh, we have groups for men and groups for women. We have groups for young adults. We have groups for adults that aren't as young as they used to be. Uh, we have groups for married couples, something for everybody. Um, and so next Sunday, following both worship services, we're going to have a life group expo on the lower level, let you know about all of our groups that are starting for the spring semester. And we want to invite you to come check out a life group and be part of one. HT Discover is our membership class. Several of you have been asking about membership. If you worship with us on a regular basis, you're already part of our family. But um, if you want to become officially a member of the church, you can sign up for HT Discover, which is starting next week, and be part of our membership class. I'm going to ask the ushers if they would come to wait on us. Jesus said, don't worry about your life, what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. Look at how your father takes care of the sparrows of the air, and you are much more valuable to him than a sparrow. Jesus said, you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and God will add to you everything that you need. How many of you have found that promise to be true? Let's just give thanks as we give back to the Lord this morning. Father, thank you that you lavished your best on us in Jesus. You so loved us that you sent your son to die on the cross, but he rose again, Lord, and we can have new life. You've saved us, Lord. And Father, you've been so good, so generous. You've provided not only for our needs, but for many of our wants. Today, with glad hearts, we give back to you tithes and offerings, missions giving, building fund giving. Father, would you let these gifts multiply? Let them be more than enough, Lord, and bless every giver in this offering today just like you said you would do. If your heart agrees, would you say amen, amen and amen? Don't you appreciate our choir this morning? I want to appreciate Joanne Carapriese, our choir director, and thank you for working hard, choir. They, they came at zero dark 30 this morning uh, to be ready to sing for us today. They're going to share while we receive the offering.
The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder, do you know him? <laughs> my king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. Yes, he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! That's my king. That's my king. Amen. just as he said. We just didn't understand it before. You have to believe us. I told you all once, and I'll tell you again, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and I put my fingers where the nails were, and my hand into his side, I will not believe. Thomas, you weren't getting it. You told us so many times, don't you remember? We were just blind. He was dead, but now he lives. You were there, John. You saw him on the cross. 
He died the most horrific death. How can you say these things? It hurts too much. Listen, please, Thomas. Believe me, the pain we all felt that day, it was so real. But it is just as they are saying. Our Messiah, Jesus, he is alive. I almost still don't believe it myself. But he called me by name, Thomas. I was crying. I, I thought he was the gardener. I was so out of my mind with grief. But he told me to tell you, to tell all of you, I saw angels. The tomb is empty. Mary, I hear you. I just can't sit here and take your word for it. If what you're all saying is true, everything has changed. I have so many unanswered questions. Unless I see for myself, I can't and I won't change my mind. But Thomas, if you don't believe us, your brothers, who will you believe? I told you, Andrew. Nothing but Jesus himself will change my mind. Don't you get it? He's not here. I feel like no one is. I feel alone. Peace be with you. My Lord and my God. It was true. All of it. He just was there in the room. He was the same, but so different. He was perfect. He knew what I had said. What I had been saying to my brothers. He had me touch his hands, the nail scars in his wrists. I imagine the nails being driven in, the agony of it all. I touched his side where they pierced him. I could feel a deep gash still there. How, how could this be possible? It wasn't possible, it was unbelievable. And yet, here he stood. He looked into my eyes and said, stop doubting and believe. My shame covered me when he said that. All I had was doubt. His eyes had nothing but love. When he spoke those words, I believed. I was changed. He knew my exact thoughts. Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. What a statement. What a conviction. Very few have had the privilege of walking with him, eating with him, of seeing the miracles he performed in front of their very eyes. How foolish I have been. I will never fathom the blessing. I have witnessed these past three years, and now it is my duty to tell others about all that he is and all that he has done. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I almost missed out on that blessing. Never again I will live the rest of my days telling others about the joy it is to follow Jesus, the miracle of his life his death, and his resurrection. All they have to do is believe in him, and they will be saved. Jesus lives. He is risen. Hallelujah! He is risen! We have a message. Hallelujah! Thomas! Are you coming? I wouldn't miss it for the world.
Come on, let's give it up for the Harvest Time Church players. We appreciate our script writer, Courtney Menking, and our directors, Kevin and Maria O'Brien. They did a good job. I'm going to share the resurrection story as told in the Gospel of John, chapter 20. I want to start with a question on this Easter Sunday morning. Do you believe in the resurrection? I'm not asking if you believe in the resurrection story as an inspiring metaphor. I'm not asking if you believe in the resurrection as a construct of the first century Christians and invention, a story that they convinced themselves of and promoted. I'm asking, do you believe in the resurrection as a fact of history? Do you believe that on the late afternoon of Good Friday, Jesus was dead, but then on the morning of Easter Sunday, he was undead? Do you believe that he crossed over to a totally new kind of existence whereby his body was supernaturally transformed into something entirely unique that had never before been seen? Do you believe in the resurrection. If you're not exactly sure this morning, take heart. You're in good company. All four Gospels report that even for Jesus' own disciples, belief did not come easily at first. What happened was so unexpected, so outside the box, that they struggled to trust their own eyes. St. John wrote his Gospel later than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And because he did, he included all kinds of stories and details that were left out by the other three. And that is true in his recollection of the Easter story. John shows how faith in the resurrection, Easter faith, came in stages for the disciples. Easter faith was formed in them throughout that first Easter Sunday and throughout that entire week after Jesus rose from the dead. Looking at John's recollections, I find some ingredients for how Easter faith is formed, and I want to share them with you this morning. Some ingredients to how Easter faith is formed. On your way in, you received a program in your program, there's an outline of today's sermon, and if you like, you can listen, watch the screens, fill in the blanks, follow along. How Easter faith is formed. First this, believe the Easter people. Believe the Easter people. When it comes to the eyewitness accounts of the first Easter, they have the ring of truth to them. They have the ring of of authenticity. For one thing, it's very clear that none of Jesus' followers had any Easter expectation when the day began. When Mary Magdalene led a group of women out to the tomb in the pre-dawn hours, they didn't hurry there to check and see if the tomb was empty. They hurried to the tomb to finish the job of embalming Jesus' dead body before it decomposed any further. When Mary saw the stone rolled away from the tomb, rather than Easter faith, her first thought was foul play. She didn't even look into the tomb to investigate. She ran to tell the disciples that Jesus' body had been stolen. John says it was still dark. In the Gospel of John, he uses darkness as a way of describing the spiritual condition of unbelief. Nicodemus came to Jesus in the dark. Judas left Jesus' presence for the last time, and it was dark. And Mary was still in the dark. Her Easter faith was not yet formed. What follows is several hours of confusion. 
running back and forth from the upper room in Jerusalem out to the garden tomb. There's misunderstanding. There's persistent unbelief. There's raw grief. There's fear. None of them anticipated the resurrection. You know, if I were going to invent the resurrection of Jesus and write myself into the story, I would have written a much more flattering picture of myself than being clumsy and unbelieving. When Peter and John heard the news, they took off running for the tomb. In what can only be described as a guy thing, John has to write down for all of posterity that he outran Peter. But at least John does fess up and admit that when they got to the tomb, he stopped at the entrance and he surveyed the scene from the doorway of the tomb. Peter came huffing and puffing along like a locomotive and he ran right past John and straight into the tomb. Unlike John, Peter studied the linen wrappings that had been around the body of Jesus. You know, due to some older English translations of John chapter 20, people have misunderstood what it was that Peter and John saw inside the tomb. The Jews wrapped bodies for burial differently than the Egyptians. The Jews started wrapping dead bodies from the chest down to the feet. The shoulders, the neck, the face were left exposed. In order to prevent the mouth from falling open in death, they rolled up a cloth and they tied it under the chin and around the head of the deceased person. Some of the older translations read that Peter saw the linen strips lying there and he saw the face cloth in a separate place folded up. That's not the right translation. It wasn't folded up. It was rolled up. And so what Peter saw was he saw the face cloth that had been around the jaw of Jesus lying exactly where it had been around Jesus' head. So this is what they witnessed. Jesus' body had not been unwrapped, not by body snatchers, not by Jesus himself. Jesus' resurrection was not like what happened to Lazarus previously. Lazarus had sat up and then he stood up and then he hopped in his grave clothes to the entrance of his tomb. But Jesus was not resuscitated and then wriggled out of his wrappings. Jesus' body was transformed into something entirely new. Jesus vanished right out of his grave clothes and everything was still wound up and lying exactly in its place. Jesus had disappeared. He had vaporized, if you will, out of the wrappings. By the way, we can deduce from this that the stone was not rolled away to let Jesus out of the tomb. The stone was rolled away to let the witnesses into the tomb. Finally, John entered and he recognized from the grave clothes what had happened. Listen, listen to this. Based on the evidence that was left behind, John was persuaded that something epic Something historic had taken place without having yet seen the risen Christ. John believed. Easter faith is formed in our hearts when we become persuaded by the eyewitness of the, of the Easter people. Without seeing the risen Christ with our own eyes, we examine the evidence left behind as reported to us by the eyewitnesses and we become persuaded that something epic has surely happened in human history. How Easter faith is formed. Believe the Easter people. Here's another thought. Believe the Easter passages. Believe the Easter passages. John adds an interesting footnote to their experience at the tomb. John says that their initial surprise on that first Easter Sunday is because they had not yet understood the Old Testament prophecies about the resurrection. On Good Friday evening, we shared with you 
the many Jewish scriptures that predicted the crucifixion, but Jesus' resurrection on the third day was also prophesied. Easter faith is formed when we believe the predictions of the Jewish prophets. King David predicted the resurrection when he wrote Psalm 16. You will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor let your Holy One decay in the grave. A thousand years before Jesus was crucified and 500 years before the Persians even invented crucifixion, David wrote a stunningly precise medical scientific description of crucifixion in Psalm 22. But listen, Psalm 22 doesn't end with death. Psalm 22 ends with resurrection. I will declare your name to my brothers. In the congregation I will praise you, for you have not despised nor disdained the suffering of your afflicted one. You haven't hidden your face from him, but listen to his cry for help. All the earths will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of nations will bow down to him. The prophet Daniel and the prophet Hosea predicted Jesus' resurrection on the third day. Jonah's deliverance from the belly of the great fish after three days was a sign of Jesus' resurrection on the third day. The prophet Isaiah not only predicted Jesus' crucifixion and burial in accurate de detail, but Isaiah also predicted his resurrection. Listen to Isaiah 53. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and, then, and, and with the rich in his death. Jesus was crucified between two terrorists and then he was buried in the tomb of a very wealthy man, Joseph of Arimathea. But listen to this. Though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, Isaiah wrote, he will see his offspring and infinitely prolong his days. Listen, after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by knowledge of him. My righteous servant will justify many and he will bear away their iniquities. John wrote that Isaiah saw in advance the glory of Christ his crucifixion, and his resurrection. Easter faith is formed when we believe the affirmations of the apostles that prophecy has indeed been fulfilled. In John chapter 2, Jesus predicted predicted his own death and resurrection he said destroy this temple and I will rebuild it again in three days John reports that after Jesus was raised from the dead the disciples recalled his words and believed the scripture preaching on the day of Pentecost Saint Peter affirmed that Psalm 16 verse 10 was fulfilled by Jesus' resurrection. Saint Paul affirmed to the Corinthians, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and raised on the third day according to the scriptures. The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 1940s proved definitively that Isaiah wrote Isaiah 52 and 53 hundreds of years before Christ. You know, students of world religions like to compare one religion with another, and they like to find similarities, thinking that all different religions are just part of one big whole, that they're all different paths to the same destination. But I want to tell you this morning that Christianity is not like any other world religion. Only Christianity has the phenomenon of fulfilled prophecy and not shadowy Nostradamus-like ramblings in his birth and life and death and resurrection and ascension. Jesus fulfilled more than 350 very specific detailed prophecies that were made about him hundreds of years in advance. God spoke through the Jewish prophets, leaving markers in human history so that we would recognize his son when he came. 
Only Christianity has a savior born in Bethlehem of a virgin named Mary, just as the Jewish prophets foretold. Only Christianity has a savior who offered his life on the cross for the sins of the world, just as the Jewish prophets foretold. Only Christianity has a savior who rose again on the third day, just as the Jewish prophets foretold. Listen, don't fight it. Listen to the Easter passages and believe how Easter faith is formed. Believe the Easter people. Believe the Easter passages. Here's another thought. Believe the Easter presence. Believe the Easter presence. By now, Mary had made it back to the tomb for the second time that morning. While Peter and John headed back to town to the upper room, Mary stayed behind and and finally, you know, the, the cork just came out. All of the grief, all of the emotion that she had been holding in since Friday, it just came spilling out and she began to ugly cry. I looked it up in Greek, what that word means when it says in John 20, she wept. It means she ugly cried. During her first trip to the tomb, she saw the stone moved away. She didn't take time to look inside. This time she looked inside. She saw two angels sitting on the preparation table where Jesus' body had been. There was one angel at his head and another angel at his feet. You know, that scene actually created a picture of the lid to the Ark of the Covenant in the temple. In the temple, on the Ark of the Covenant, the lid had two angels, one at either end, and in the center is where the blood, the atoning blood of the sacrifice went. Jesus is the mercy seat. Jesus is the lid to the Ark of the Covenant. Just then, Mary turned and she saw Jesus standing behind her, but she didn't recognize him right away. You know, we can learn something about resurrection bodies from this passage. Resurrection bodies have continuity with our physical bodies. It's the same body transformed. Jesus still had evidence of the wounds of Calvary on his resurrection body, but there was something different about his resurrection body as well so that those who saw him didn't recognize him right away. At the end of this age, every believer in Jesus will receive a resurrection body. Now listen, this is my pet peeve and you all know it. You will not become an angel when you die. Angels are a different class of created being. And God actually has appointed for us a place that's higher than the angels. You won't become an angel. You will receive a resurrection body, your body transformed. You'll still look like you, but you'll look better than you do now. Maybe I'll get my hair back. (laughs) Maybe I'll get those six packs of abs I always wanted and never had. Your resurrection body will be you 2.0. But listen, listen to this. Listen, listen. It wasn't the sight of Jesus that helped Mary believe, it was the sound of his voice. When Jesus said her name, Mary, then she recognized him. And so we learn that Easter faith is formed not by seeing, but Easter faith is formed by hearing the word of the Lord, God's living voice speaking to us in a very personal and in a very compelling way. Every Sunday before I leave my office to preach, I I pray two things. The first thing I pray is that every person will hear a word from the Lord. That every person will hear something personal, something compelling, something that ministers to them in a specific way. The second thing I pray is that the Lord won't let me say anything I'm not supposed to say. And believe me, in an election year, he has his hands full with me on that one. But every week, people tell me at the door, Pastor, that word was just for me. They come from all different walks of life. They're at all different stages in life, going through all different struggles in life. And yet God spoke something good, personal, that made a difference. I don't have to tell you, that's not me. 
That's the Holy Spirit speaking the living word of God to people. Listen, you don't have to wait until Sunday morning. You don't have to wait until Wednesday night. You don't have to wait until your next life group meeting to hear something good from him. Just pick up your Bible and read it. Put the Bible on audio. Listen to it. And I promise you, you'll hear his living voice speaking to you. Mary fell down in worship and grabbed a hold of the feet of Jesus. But Jesus said to her, don't hold on to me, Mary. I'm ascending to my father and to your father. Another note about resurrection bodies. They have human form and they have real physical substance. They can be seen. They can be heard. They can be touched. We find out later they can eat and enjoy food. Thank you, Jesus. (laughs) And yet they're suitable for the atmospheres of both earth and heaven. You know what the Bible says we're going to do in heaven? It says we're going to eat and then we're going to worship. And then we're going to eat some more and then we're going to worship some more. And then what could be better than that? And then we're going to eat some more and then we're going to worship some more. I think the Lord's going to let J.J. Cassone into heaven so that there'll be Easter bread. J.J. Cassone's Easter bread in heaven. When Mary saw Jesus alive, she thought, that everything was going to resume as it was before the cross. But Jesus said, no, no, Mary, you can't hold on to me like that. Jesus was letting her know that the nature of their relationship was changing. Jesus would remain present with Mary and the disciples, but in a new way through the Holy Spirit. Slowly, Mary's Easter faith was growing. She started out the day in darkness, but now she ran and told the disciples, I have seen the Lord. She recognized that Jesus is more than just a good teacher. She recognized that he is Lord. He is God. Later that evening, the disciples were locked in the upper room. Jesus appeared to them. Jesus showed all of them the wounds in his hands and in his sides. Resurrection bodies have human form and physical substance. They have continuity with our human body. And yet, resurrection bodies can appear and disappear through stone and stucco walls, through locked doors. Jesus said to them, peace be with you. And he breathed the Holy Spirit onto them. Jesus was about to ascend to the Father in heaven where he is now. But Jesus' presence stayed on with the disciples in the person of the Holy Spirit before Jesus went to the cross. That's precisely what he promised. He said, I won't leave you as orphans. I will come to you. The world won't see me anymore, but you will see me. I'll ask the Father and he'll send another helper, another comforter, another counselor, another strengthener to be with you. The spirit of truth, he lives with you and he will be in you. On this Easter Sunday morning, we can't physically see the risen Christ, but Easter faith is formed inside of us when we experience his living presence among us. You know, every week we have people who worship at HTC for the first time. And they experience something that they've never experienced before. Many people cry and they don't know why they're crying. Others feel an excitement, a a joy. They feel uplifted. They feel inspired. I want to tell you what they're feeling is the Holy Spirit. What they're feeling is Easter presence. Before we moved onto this campus, we worshiped in the Western Greenwich Civic Center for 20 years. Our first Easter on this campus was in 2024 in the old sanctuary. The Greenwich Times sent a reporter to cover this momentous Easter for our congregation. She was a Jewish young lady. At the end of our first worship service, we were singing the song, No Other Name But the Name of Jesus. No other name but the name of the Lord is worthy of glory and honor and of praise. Some ushers brought her up to me at the end of the first service and she was shaking. 
and having a difficult time speaking. Being the great man of faith and power that I am, I thought she was having some kind of medical episode. I thought she was having a panic attack. I didn't know what was wrong. We went back to the office, sat down. She had a glass of water. And after she collected herself, she said, please excuse me. She said, I have never felt anything like that before in my life. What was it? It was Easter presents. Several years ago, we asked our friends at the Greenwich Police Department if they would keep a watchful eye on us on Sunday mornings and on Wednesdays while we're worshiping. The detective who is now in charge of scheduling the officers every Sunday was the first one who started coming on Sunday mornings. And he was so overwhelmed by the worship, he called his wife on his cell phone and he held up his cell phone and he said, listen to this. When I invited people to pray a prayer of believing on Jesus at the end, he was in the very back of the sanctuary. He's supposed to be watching us and he's back there like this. I said, all right, Jesus, the angels better be on duty while our officer is praying. How many of you know the angels are always on duty? What was it he experienced? He experienced the Holy Spirit. He experienced Easter presence. By the way, his whole family worships now at our friend Pastor Mark Evans' church in Trumbull, up where they live. They're all followers of Jesus and believers of Jesus. We had such an awesome time on Good Friday evening. I want to say how grateful I am to Pastor Raphael and Lara and our whole worship team and our creative team. I'm grateful to everyone who served on Friday evening, ushering, parking lot, downstairs, all over the house. You know, the Lord's presence was with us the whole night on Good Friday evening, but there was a moment when Pastor Nick sang that hymn, The Old Rugged Cross. There was a moment when the beautiful presence of the Holy Spirit came wafting into this place. Did you feel it if you were here? That was Easter presence. Some of you might feel him here this morning. I want to say to you, don't fight it. Just believe. Along with Easter presence, believe the Easter peace. Poor Thomas. He gets such a bad rap. You know, the name Thomas, Thomas was a nickname. It wasn't his real name. His real name was Judas. But they called him Judas Thomas or Didymus. The word means a twin. And the church fathers write that the reason he had the nickname the twin is because he looked very much like Jesus. He looked like Jesus' twin. Poor Thomas. He gets such a bad rap. He happened to be out making a Costco run when Jesus came. After all, 11 upset men can plow through a lot of chips and salsa in a weekend. He was at Costco. And when he got back, not only did no one help him schlep the groceries up the up, upstairs to the upper room, but everyone was talking excitedly. We've seen the Lord. We've seen the Lord. We've seen the Lord. He, he forever bears the nickname. His nickname was Twin, but now he forever bears the nickname Doubting Thomas. But all he really wanted to see was the same evidence that the others had seen. That wasn't too much to ask for. They had examined Jesus' wounds. Why shouldn't he be entitled to the same proof? Thomas was about to discover that Jesus' presence was right there in the room, even though his body wasn't. When Jesus did appear the following Sunday, he said, I heard you, Thomas. Challenge accepted. See my hands. See my side. Stop being stubborn, Thomas, and believe. Jesus was listening when Thomas was being stubborn, but I love this. Jesus didn't scold him for a third time. Jesus said, peace to be with you. Peace, peace, peace. Triple acting peace. Peace perfectly cubed. You know, on this Easter Sunday morning, we can't physically see the risen Christ, 
but Easter faith is formed in us when we experience his peace. His peace relieves our anxiety. His peace liberates us from fear. I want to tell you, I do not live my life in fear because God is with me. His presence is with me and I feel his peace. His peace makes us secure. His peace makes us calm and confident when we have every reason to be freaking out. His peace makes us joyful when it doesn't make sense to others. I've been using the same auto mechanic for the last 20 years. We've become friends. And I've prayed with him many times across the years over situations happening in his family, different things. He has relatives who attend HTC and he's been to services here several times. And he tells me, he says, every time I go to your church, I feel so good afterwards. I always had the best week after that. I feel lighter. I feel happy. You know, I had uh, many people say the same thing to me. And as I smile, I think, then why don't you come back, dummy? <laughs> what is it they're feeling? They're feeling Easter peace. Listen to me, if you should experience Easter peace today, if you should experience Easter peace this coming week, and you will, I want to tell you right now in advance, you're going to have a good week this week. You're going to feel lighter. You're going to feel happier. You're going to feel more at ease. I'm telling you, when you feel the Easter peace, don't fight it. Just believe. Got to pray with a young man at a wake a little over a week ago. He's been suffering from, he works in a very, very stressful industry, very, very stressful job, and he's been struggling with anxiety so that he can't sleep at night. And so a few of us stood in a circle and we held hands and we prayed. And I just said what Jesus said, peace I leave. I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world lives. You know, he called me the next morning. He said, Pastor, I slept through the whole night. I not only slept through the whole night, I overslept. If you experience his peace, believe it. How Easter faith is formed. Believe the Easter people. Believe the Easter passages. Believe the Easter presence and peace. Finally this, join the Easter praise. Join the Easter praise. I actually agree with some commentators. I think that by the time the next Sunday rolled around, Thomas was already convinced why do I believe that? Because he was there. The following Sunday, he was there in the upper room with the disciples. He had an abandoned ship. Isn't it more than a coincidence that the one who struggled the most with his faith was the one who was absent the previous Sunday? If you're missing from church, you miss out on so many good things that God wants to give you. You deprive yourself of faith. You deprive yourself of his manifest presence and peace. May I make an Easter appeal to you? Next Sunday, we will be here. Next Sunday, Jesus will be here. His Easter peace will be here. His Easter presence will be here. His living voice will be here next Sunday. Would you join us next Sunday? Jesus heard what Thomas said. He showed Thomas his wounds. And he spoke to Thomas, but really Jesus addressed everyone in the room. What he said was meant for all of his disciples back then and now. Stop fighting it. Just believe. Thomas didn't need a whole lot of convincing. He worshipped Jesus. He said, my Lord and my God. You know, Thomas gets a bad rap, but actually Thomas is the first one in the Gospel of John to express fully formed Easter faith, my Lord and my God. And that's precisely what Jesus said is possible for us. It's what he wants for us. It's what he wants from us. Although we can't physically see the risen Christ, Jesus said that we can enter into the same experience of fully formed Easter faith as those first disciples in the upper room. 
In fact, Jesus said that we can receive an extra blessing that they couldn't receive. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus announced eight blessings over everyone who follows him. But here in John chapter 20, in the upper room, he announced a ninth blessing that's available to us that wasn't available to them. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet believe. Would you join the Easter praise this morning. Would you confess Jesus as your Lord, your King, the leader of your life, the one to whom you owe your loyalty and your allegiance, the one whom you serve and obey? Would you confess Jesus as your God, the object of your adoration, the recipient of your worship, the one worth living for, and if necessary, the one worth dying for? Would you join the Easter praise, how Easter faith is formed. Believe the Easter people. Believe the Easter passages. Believe the Easter presence and the Easter peace and come join the Easter praise. Would you stand on your feet and give Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, a great big praise on this Easter Sunday morning? Oh, one more time. You can do better. One more time. I asked Pastor Nick to help us out with a song that goes back a little ways. You know, my son, I'm I'm so proud of my son on the piano on Good Friday evening. He did such a great job. My, My son was playing a worship chorus from like 10 years ago. He said, Dad, that's an old song. I'm like, no, a mighty fortress is our God that's like 500 years old. That's an old song, okay? A chorus from 10 years ago is not an old song. Maybe just a little dusty. There's a song that goes back a little ways. It says, I believe in Jesus. I believe he is the son of God. I believe he died and rose again. I believe he paid for us all. Some of you remember it. Pastor Nick's going to help us sing it. Join us as we sing. I believe in Jesus. I believe he is the Son of God. I believe he died and he rose again. I believe he paid for us all. And I believe. I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I believe He is the Son of God. I believe He died and He rose again. I believe He paid for us all. I believe He's here. And I believe. I believe in you, Lord. I believe in you, Lord. I believe, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died and you rose again. I believe you paid for us all. I believe you're here yet, and I believe you are here.
In just one moment, we're going to conclude our service. We have Easter bread and coffee downstairs for you, some places for you to take photos in your Easter Sunday best. But just before we finish our service, I'd like to lead you in a prayer of believing on Jesus. You know, the way that we respond to the cross, the way that we respond to Easter Sunday, the way that we respond to the gospel message, is by praying a prayer of believing on Jesus, expressing Easter faith. I wonder if you're here today and you've never prayed a prayer like that before. I'd like to lead you in a prayer like that today. Maybe you're here today and you prayed a prayer of believing on Jesus a long time ago, but a lot of water has gone under the bridge since then. And today would be a great day to pray it again for the first time in a long time. I want to invite you if you just bow your heads with me and I'm wondering if you're here today and you'd like to join me for the first time or the first time in a long time in a prayer of believing on Jesus I'm just going to lead you in a prayer right there in your seat if you'd like to join me in that prayer for the first time would you just while heads are bowed would you just lift your hand high where I can see it oh come on thank you lots of hands all over the place like to join me in a prayer for the first time or the first time in a long time like to join me in a prayer believing on Jesus thank you Lord so good somebody else for the first time or the first time just lift your hand up real high where I can see it thank you father I want to invite everybody in this place would you lift your hands with me and I'm going to lead in a prayer and I want to invite you if you're willing would you just follow me in a nice clear voice let's pray Let's express Easter faith this morning. Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your only son. Jesus, thank you for coming. You lived a perfect life for me. You died on the cross for me. Jesus, I believe. You are the son of God. I believe. You rose from the dead. I confess with my mouth. Jesus is Lord. Jesus, forgive my sins. Wash me. Make me a new person. Give me the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, I receive you now as my Lord, the leader of my life and my God. In Jesus' name, amen.
Listen, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, we have a prayer room. It's across the foyer in that direction. We'd love for you to stop by. We have a gift that we want to share with you. We want to pray a prayer of blessing over you before you go on and enjoy your Easter Sunday and a new week. I want to, everybody, listen, Easter peace. I want you to say, say Easter peace with me. This week, you're going to have, you're going to feel Easter peace with you this week. Amen. I'm going to ask our friend Teo Richard Deli, if he would come. Teo is for our benediction going to bless us with the Lord's Prayer. You can remain standing. And after Teo has sung, um, we're going to be dismissed. Would you welcome him? Thank you so much. Happy Easter, everybody. Happy Easter. But the choir has one more song. Don't go away.
Happy Easter, everyone. Have a blessed day.